All right. Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. Glad you guys are tuning in today. If you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions for guests that you'd like to see on the show, feel free to shoot me a DM on Instagram at Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro, or you can email me at Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast at gmail.com. On today's show, I'm super excited. We have Dr. James Maddox on the show, and we're going to introduce James in just a sec, but first he is going to tell us why we should tune into the show today. Sure. Uh, thanks, Toby. Uh, today's topic will be the, the topic of self-efficacy, and self-efficacy is a very important component of what is known as self-regulation or the ability to basically get done things that you want to get done, how to set goals, how to organize, how to develop plans, how to organize your time. And uh, most people who are busy, people with busy jobs uh, have difficulty getting done the, all the things they want to get done. And often that is through failures of self-regulation. Um, so we'll be talking about self-efficacy specifically, but more broadly about the issue of self-regulation. Again, how to organize your own behavior, organize yourself to um, accomplish things in life. And that seems to me to be a pretty important topic. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing today. This is the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast, the neurohacking show where we teach you how to optimize your cognition. Keep up to date at Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro.com. Now here's your host, Toby Passman. And to give you guys just a bit more of a background on uh, Dr. Maddox, he is a university professor emeritus in the Department of Psychology and senior scholar at the Center for the Advancement of Well-Being at J George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. He's also a fellow of the American Psychological Association and the Association for Psychological Science. So Jim, super excited to have you on the show with us today. Great, me too. So tell me a little about just kind of, you know, your your uh, introduction to the field of psychology and, and how you eventually got into this, the, the area of psychology in which you became a real expert in? Well, that's a long story. I was actually, let's see, a, it was the summer after my first year in my uh, doctoral clinical psychology program at the University of Alabama. And it was a course we were taking in social psychology. And one of the articles that was assigned to us was an article published by Albert Bandura in 1977, where he introduced the notion of self-efficacy and described some research he had done and talked about why it was important. And it uh, just caught my attention. And I began doing some research on self-efficacy as a graduate student, continued that as a faculty member and I uh, have followed the research over the years and just find it to be a really interesting topic, but also a very practical topic because again, as I said, uh, self-efficacy is an important part of self-regulation uh, and self-regulation is a skill that can be acquired and learned uh, and self-regulation self is important in helping people accomplish things they want to accomplish. And it just struck me as something that was uh, theoretically interesting and eminently practical. And, and what were some of the, the things that stood out to you as you started learning more and more about self-efficacy? Like what, what do listeners need to know about it? Well, self-efficacy is very similar to the notion of self-confidence, which is a term most people are familiar with. But self-confidence self is usually viewed as a personality trait, a general trait that you have a lot of or not much of, and you're kind of stuck with whatever <laughs> whatever amount of it you have, you're kind of stuck with it. Whereas self-efficacy is more concerned with self-confidence in specific areas of life and specific situations, specific behaviors, such as my belief in my ability. Sorry, there's a big truck going by. Luckily, this isn't live, so we can just cut that little part out. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so self-efficacy is concerned with my belief about my ability to uh, perform specific behaviors in specific situations, 
in order to accomplish specific goals. So it's not a personality trait. And a person, for example, can have high self-efficacy in one area of life, for example, for um, athletics, but low self-efficacy for musical ability, high self-efficacy for um, <clears throat> academic work, low self-efficacy for fixing my car. Uh, so we're talking about self-confidence in specific areas of life, specific situations. And even more so concerned with my beliefs about my ability to perform the behaviors that I think I need to perform to get the results that I want to get. That if I do, if I can do X, Y, and Z, then something that I want will result from being able to do X and Y and Z at a certain level of proficiency. So it's self-confidence, but more specific and focused than that. Yeah. Okay. So it's like the ability to kind of have confidence in a specific, uh, achieve some specific uh, goal in some, um, some area and, and have some kind of outcome come from that. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And what are some of the factors that we know of that kind of determine one's self-efficacy in a specific area? Well, there's at least five different influences on self-efficacy. The most important and most powerful is uh, what are called uh, performance enactments, actually doing something and doing something well and acquiring a skill. Uh, or And if you do something well or believe you're doing it well, your self-efficacy for that particular behavior in that situation will be enhanced if you believe that your performance of that behavior in that situation was inadequate, then your self-efficacy will be reduced. And self-efficacy can be, uh, it, it's a accumulation of experiences with a particular behavior in a particular situation. So, so doing something well or poorly, uh, or believing you're doing well or poorly is the most important, most powerful source of self-efficacy. We also can have what are called vicarious experiences or watching people do something well and learn by watching them. And if someone is doing something well, and if I believe I, I'm similar to that person, that I'm likely to believe that I, should, I might be able to do that too. So we sometimes refer to this as modeling experiences or watching other people accomplish things. There's also verbal persuasion or having people give you a little pep talk telling you that they believe that you are capable of, uh, of, of performing this or doing this or pro providing an opposite end discouragement saying, you know, I don't think you ought to try that because you probably, uh, that's, that's probably, that's probably not going to work out for you. So those verbal for attempts at verbal persuasion from other people, other important people in your life can also be, can also influence self-efficacy. The way you, you can imagine yourself performing something and imagine yourself performing something well, and we all probably do this if you are going to give, if, if you're going for a job interview or you're going to give a presentation in front of a committee at your job, you will probably, you can do some rehearsing in your head for uh, what problems you might encounter in that situation, uh, what, you what you would do to respond to a difficult question. What you would do, for example, if the equipment broke down, so you can rehearse ways of coping with problems that might occur, and you can imagine yourself and, and see yourself performing well, or on the opposite of that, performing poorly, and imagine things going poorly, which of course is going to generate lots of anxiety about the situation, which then of course, because you're anxious, you do poorly as a result of the anxiety you've generated by imagining yourself doing poorly. We also pay attention to what's happening inside, to our bodies, to our emotions. And if in the middle of doing something important, such as um, a job interview, giving a talk, um, a musical performance, an athletic performance, if you, if you start keying into uh, bodily sensations and misinterpreting them as indications that you are anxious or worried, then that can interfere with the performance and lead to a, a diminishing of your self-efficacy beliefs for that performance. So we've got at least five different factors come, going into this. Again, the most powerful is actually doing something and believing that you are doing it well and having a sense of success. So what are, what are some of the differences in uh, performance outcomes, say in two different individuals, one with a high level of self-efficacy 
versus an individual with low self-efficacy who maybe have the same uh, same skill set in that area? That's a great question. This is where the issue of self-regulation comes in. And, and, and again, self-efficacy beliefs are important because they do tie into the system of self-regulation. One of the things we know from research is that people who have higher self-efficacy for a particular area or performance actually set higher goals to themselves. That if I feel confident in my ability to do something well, I'm likely to set the bar a little bit higher than someone who has less confidence than I do in, my, in their ability to do it well. It's also important in that uh, if we have higher self-efficacy, we're more likely to develop um, effective plans and plans are important and plans involve, of course, setting sub goals and, and steps along the way to get us to where we want to go. It's particularly important when people encounter challenges along the way. Anything important that you want to accomplish is going to be probably going to be difficult at times. And your level of self-efficacy starting out has a big impact on how you respond to challenges and setbacks. People with higher self-efficacy are going to uh, be more emotionally resilient in response to uh, setbacks and challenges, are more likely to be good problem solvers about how to get around this problem, how to, how to overcome this challenge, and are more likely to be persistent when they encounter challenges. And of course, persistence and good problem solving usually leads to greater success. And greater success uh, subsequently leads to uh, a greater sense of self-efficacy. So as there's a, a sort of virtuous cycle that is set in place when someone starts out with a relatively high level of self-efficacy. On the other hand, if someone's self-efficacy is relatively low, when they encounter challenges, they're more likely to get distressed uh, or depressed or angry and experience an emotion that is going to get in the way of effective problem solving, because we know that it's difficult to be a good problem solver when you're upset, anxious, angry, or agitated. So that person is now setting up a, uh, a vicious cycle where the low self-efficacy uh, leads to where low self-efficacy in the face of challenges leads to some temporary emotional disturbance, which leads to difficulty in problem solving, which means the person is more likely to give up than persist. And because the person gives up more easily and doesn't persist, the person is not going to accomplish what he or she wants to accomplish, which will then lead to an even lower sense of self-efficacy for that particular experience or situation. So this is reminding me a lot of like flow state sort of psychology, like Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi sort of stuff mm -hmm. where, where he mm -hmm. talks about that, uh, that sort of graph, right? Between where there's like on the, what is it? The X axis, I think it's difficulty and the Y axis is skill. So it's right. like, if, if something is, if a challenge is, is too difficult for your level of skill, you're gonna perform poorly, which is probably gonna reinforce a lower self-efficacy that you're not you're not capable of, of doing that whereas if it's too easy um you might just get bored whereas like that that kind of flow area where you want to be is sort of in right in the middle where, where the, the the challenge is sort of fitting your skill set is that it, it, related yeah, it, it is and i would probably say that it's not so much the skill set, but the skill set combined with your self-efficacy. Because so two, two people can have the same skill set, but in any situation could have higher or lower self-efficacy for actually using those skills effectively. And so we need to include not just what a person is capable of doing, which is the skill set, but what a person believes he or she is capable of doing with those skills in this particular situation. And we've okay. all probably in life encountered situations where, where we, uh, we had the skill set, but something has not worked out right in this situation that has knocked us off kilter. And so we temporarily lose our sense lose our self-confidence and our ability to, to use that skill set effectively. Okay. And in terms of like, are there proven ways that we can, uh, that people can, that we can instill self-efficacy in others, like say parents, teachers, coaches, uh, 
are there are there any methods where we can actually teach people to cultivate self-efficacy? Uh, yes. Um, one way is through encouragement, through verbal persuasion. But even more important than that, uh, and you mentioned that you are taking a certification in, in, in coaching. Correct. And a coach, by definition, whether it's uh, an athletic coach or a musical coach or a life coach, is someone who we assume knows a little something more about this particular topic or skill set than the person who is being coached. And the coach's job is to observe, to listen, and to give specific feedback on how the person can improve his or her performance. So it's not just a coach doesn't just say that was great or that wasn't, uh, that wasn't so good, but a coach uh, or uh, whether it's musical or athletic or, or, or anything says, so here's what I think you can do to improve your performance. Here's a way to improve your backhand. Here's what you might do if you want to improve your, uh, 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 um, the, the way you play this part of the Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. So a specific feedback about specific skills as opposed to just saying, wow, that was great. It's that was great, that was better because here's what you did differently. That's what people can do. And, and very often, I think what, what parents often forget or what we often forget if we are managers or supervisors is we tend to rely on, hey, that was good or hey, that wasn't so good as a, or simply, hey, you need to try harder as opposed to, so here's what I think you could do to make that performance just a little bit better. So it needs to be specific specific feedback about specific behaviors, not just cheerleading. Okay, okay, so more so kind of constructive criticism in a way. Constructive criticism, feedback, um, specific feedback. Uh, criticism is a word that has such a negative connotation to it. So we'll just use the, the more general word feedback, but, in, but and, and, and constructive can also be critical in what's often helpful is to tell someone, okay, you did it, this way, or you did this, or you did this, or I heard you say this. That probably is not the best way to do it or to say it, that a better way might be to do it this way. So it can involve telling someone what they're doing that's not working, but it has to include what they need to do to do it better or differently. And we often forget that part of the, the specific feedback part of it. Got it. Now, Jim. One of the pieces uh, that I, I read that you were really interested about uh, or a subject being the, the information intention behavior gap in which okay. people know what's good and bad for them, uh, but trying to find out what keeps them from making the shift from behavior so they know uh, or that they know is bad to behavior that they know is good. So what, what did you kind of find in your exploration of that question? That is very complicated. <laughs> and and people are still trying to figure that out. And the main issue is as you as you uh, as you described it is um, we often know what's good for us, and we often know what we should do or need to do. Uh, whether it's losing weight, cutting back on smoking or alcohol, or getting more exercise, or eating less fatty food, we we typically have the information we need in order to do what we, what we need to do. And we often have good intentions where we say, okay, yes, I am, I'm definitely going to start doing this. Where we often fall down is not having specific plans for how to implement those intentions. And self-efficacy is an important component in helping us follow through, uh, close the gap between intent, between intending to do something and actually doing it when the situation arises. And there's one particular uh, skill that has been shown by quite a lot of research to work is the formation of what are called implementation intentions, which is a fancy way of simply saying, think about <clears throat> situations in which you are probably going to have an opportunity to try out this new behavior or to try to change a behavior you want to change. 
And so you say to yourself, or write down a list of, of situations, and you say to yourself, you form the intention, if I encounter this situation, or when I encounter this situation, here is what I'm going to do. So you drill into your head responses that you are going to implement when the opportunity arises. For example, if you are trying to uh, uh, eat a healthier diet, um, you say to yourself, okay, when I enter the supermarket, the first thing I'm going to do is head for the produce department and buy healthy foods, as opposed to going to, I don't know, the candy department or the processed food department. Uh, so, and, and so, and if you form that intention, then when you enter the store, that thought is going to pop into your head, which is going to increase the probability that you actually will gravitate toward the produce department versus going to the, I don't know, the frozen, the, 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 the ice cream freezer and filling your cart full of ice cream. So those, those are some, uh, uh, some well-researched ways of th that people can close that intention behavior gap. And it's simple, but I like simple strategies because people can remember them. Right, right. So kind of sounds like forming a very clear action plan of, of what sort of steps someone's going to need to take in exactly. order to, to get them that desire. Exactly. Goal. An, an action plan, yes. And rehearsing it in your head and writing it down. Do we know which is uh, better according to the research, whether, because a lot of people are, you know, say, if you don't write down your goals, you're not going to achieve them, whereas other people are, are more so just, you know, don't care as much about that. Do we know what the research says? Uh, yes, the research says the more concrete you get, the more likely you are to actually do something and that writing things down helps you think them through and visualize them. And it's very often people will have a plan in their head uh, that they think is clear. Uh, but then if someone says, so what's your plan? They say, well, you know, I, what I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm probably going to maybe cut down on the amount of ice cream I eat. So how are you planning on doing that? Well, I hadn't thought about that yet. So writing things down forces you to be more clear than simply spinning things around in your head. I see. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask you about the, the position of, of being a senior scholar at the George Mason, Mason Center for the Advancement of Well-Being. That just the, the name of that center really, you know, is, is so interesting because it's like, you know, a lot of psychology is so focused on, on disorders and what's wrong, whereas right. it sounds like this whole center is kind of focused on advancing well-being. So what kind of tell me about what, what sort of goes on at that, at that center and, and well, what well, you it's, play? Well, it's multidisciplinary and it is based on the assumption that uh, being a healthy person uh, is more than just not being an unhealthy person. That is more that, that, that well-being is more than not just experiencing depression or anxiety or other problems, but uh, taking what you, uh, taking your abilities and trying to maximize them, uh, developing resilience. So trying to put yourself above a normal level of sort of boring, um, boring, I'm not unhealthy, but I could be doing better and thriving better. In life, it's all it's it's very much tied into the so-called positive psychology movement, which again is, as people probably have, if if you've read about this, is concerned with uh, not just with, with alleviating suffering in in people, but helping people to uh, to thrive, and and to uh, uh, to be uh, happier and more content and developing resilience, which is where I think self-regulation comes in, because people often have a, have the difficulty. Uh, thriving in life because they have difficulty getting themselves organized and, and accomplishing things that they would like to accomplish in life. And in, in terms of like self-regulation, the, the first sort of study that comes to my mind is like the marshmallow test, right? Where it's, you know, testing uh, children's you, ability. Right, to, you're thinking of um, Walter Michelle. Right, yeah. right. Testing whether a, a, a child can either... Uh, if they're going to go for the one marshmallow right away, or if they can hold off for uh, 30 minutes or whatever it was in order to get uh, multiple marshmallows. And right. they, they saw that that actually predicted very well, like people's, uh, like these kids' success as they 
got into adulthood in terms exactly. of their, their self-regulation. Exactly. And I so, think more importantly, what those studies showed is that those children employ specific strategies and they could describe specific strategies they used to delay gratification. They would, say, they would say things like, well, okay, so I decided if I close my eyes and couldn't see the marshmallows, then I wouldn't want to eat them. Or if I closed my eyes and sang a song to myself, then I wouldn't be thinking about the marshmallows. So the kids who were able to delay gratification employ specific strategies. And self-regulation is about, it, here's where part of the confusion is that I think what, what Walter Rochelle did well is help point out the distinction between um, self-regulation and willpower. And people tend to view willpower as a personality trait that you have a certain amount of that's fixed and either you have enough of it or you don't. And so we say, well, I can't lose weight. I don't have enough willpower. Boy, he lost 10 pounds. He must have a lot of willpower which means it's something about him, something he has that I don't have. And I think what Walter Michelle's study helped show is that self-regulation is not a personality trait, but it is a set of skills that can be taught and learned. These kids employed, a, each, each one employed a very, very specific but simple self-regulation strategy. And which is why it's better and more effective to view, to forget about willpower as a personality trait, but think about self-regulation as a set of, as a specific set of skills that can be taught and can be learned and can be enhanced by, through practice, just like any other set of skills. And people get stuck thinking, you know, I don't have enough willpower. And that becomes the excuse for not doing something. But if they switch, if they turn a switch and think about self-regulation and maybe do some reading about self-regulation and maybe see a life coach who can help them get themselves organized and self-regulate, then they're going to stop thinking about me as a person without willpower and me as a person who has, who is developing better self-regulation skills. So there's a huge difference in, in that kind of thinking. Right, a big paradigm shift there. And it, and it sounds like the, the strategies that you were talking about, just like the self-regulation strategies of like, you know, how those kids were able to avoid eating the marshmallow. I mean, it sounds pretty similar, like to what we were talking about before with the example of someone wanting to eat healthier and them kind of telling themselves, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to just go to the specific area of the grocery store, the, the, the vegetable section where, where I'm going to kind of be able to um, get the foods that are going to help me accomplish that goal. So exactly. there's a lot exactly. of similarity there. I mean, for example, if, if I have um, snack foods in the house, if I have cookies and chips, um, my self-regulation kind of goes out the window and I, exer I exercise my self-regulation at the grocery store. And I, I simply don't buy the stuff and therefore it's not in my house because I, I understand myself well enough to know that my self-regulation abilities for purchasing things in the store is much better than it is for having it at having for not eating the stuff when I have it at home. So part of it's knowing your own strengths and weaknesses and uh, capitalizing on those. Now, when it comes to say like peak performers, people you know, pro athletes, business executives, um, does willpower have a role to play? Uh, like in in say you know, what separates kind of the, the top of the field, the, the Kobe Bryant's, the Michael Jordan's, you know, because I, I think to myself, like, okay, this is someone, you know, who, who goes to the gym every single day, four in the morning, like you think, you think of that being very like, willpower oriented, but it sounds like, you know, from what we've been talking about, there might be a lot more to it related to self regulation. Uh, I, I totally agree. I, I think that there's certainly an element of, of motivation and desire and drive, which isn't the same thing as willpower, self-regulation. I, I know a lot of people who are driven, but they just don't know where to drive. They just can't, they can't get themselves in gear. And so I think the Kobe Bryant's and the Michael Jordan's and the uh, world-class uh, uh, um, uh, musicians, uh, the people who excel at anything, um, probably they have a plan, 
And that plan includes going to the gym at 4 a.m. or going to the gym after work at 7 a.m. or putting in X number of hours a day practicing this or practicing that or reading up on this, reading up on that. So there's what you don't see, what we, what, what we usually see is the end result. We see the tennis champion winning at Wimbledon three times in a row. We see the, uh, the Steve Jobs and the Jeff Bezos uh, develop, uh, building multi-billion dollar companies. We see uh, musicians who excel. We see the Williams sisters um, uh, winning uh, tennis tournaments. What we don't see is the years and years and years of planning and practice that went in to that. So we tend to, I think, give too much credit to uh, um, innate talent and not enough credit to a person's drive and motivation and the hard work they put into developing those skills, including developing their self-efficacy for those skills. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. There, there is a, there's a, there's a, what's called the... Uh, 10,000 hour rule. And that's a, a rough way of saying that, that if you want to get really, really good at something, um, it's going to take about 10,000 hours of practice to get, to get really, to, to really excel at it. If you if you look at uh, the fact that Tiger Woods began golfing at age four, I think, and the Williams sister began playing tennis at age five or six. Uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon began writing songs at 15, 16 years old. And after about 10 years, they got really good at it. Uh, so uh, we're talking about put, applying your craft uh, um, with diligence and over time, um, getting feedback and uh, correcting and persisting, developing self-efficacy. Um, and the end result after that usually is being pretty good at something, as opposed to blaming your inability to do it on the fact that you just don't have the innate talent to do that, which I don't usually buy into it's a lot easier to just come up with that as an excuse rather than right. to look any further <laughs> it's, it's very easy <laughs> right right so jim in terms of like the applications of of your research on self-efficacy like what have what have been some of the coolest applications that you've been aware of um, or or say things that you would like to see areas uh, that you would like to see your research being applied more so kind of going forward in the future well, I think one of the most important and, and exciting um, developments and exciting uses of it is in psychotherapy and what is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And cognitive behavioral therapy is a, is a type of therapy that is not concerned with trying to reconstruct your past, with trying to find out what happened to you at age five or six or seven that made you neurotic or made you uh, uh, prone toward depression or made you prone to be an angry person, but looking at specific situations in your life uh, that aren't working well for you, uh, looking at specific goals you would like to accomplish in life that you aren't accomplishing, whether it's uh, improving a relationship, whether it's uh, improving your performance at work, whether it's uh, managing your social anxiety better, whether it's preparing for an upcoming job interview. And so the cognitive behavioral therapist uh, takes a problem apart piece by piece and helps the person understand uh, what he or she is thinking or feeling in that situation, what he or she uh, is and how that affects the way the person behaves and then trying to change the way the person thinks and change the way the person behaves in order to accomplish the goals that the person wants to accomplish in those particular situations. So it's a very fine-grained analysis of thinking and feeling and behaving. And a major part of this, of cognitive behavioral therapy, is having the person go out and practice a new set of behaviors and a new way of behaving in order to develop confidence or self-efficacy in those new skills. For example, if a person has problems with social anxiety, the cognitive behavioral therapist may ask the person to uh, say good morning to one stranger on the street each day, or to, or to speak to three people in, uh, in line at the grocery store in a one-week period uh, to learn how to, uh, 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 to, to manage the anxiety, to learn that people aren't going to uh, um, 
slap you across the face if you talk to them. So they help the person develop the skills and develop confidence in, in their ability to implement those skills. So self-efficacy is a very important component of cognitive behavioral therapy, which has been shown to be effective for a wide, wide range of psychological problems, depression, anxiety, addictions, um, just about everything. Right, right. I didn't necessarily make that connection until you just said that, but I mean, that's awesome that kind of self-efficacy is built into what I believe is the most common kind of form of, of behavioral therapy going on right now. Uh, it, it's, I'm, it may not be the most common, but it's the, it's the most well-researched and the okay. most effective. Um, uh, it, it, hopefully one day it'll be the most common. Okay, got it, got it. So in terms of like kind of, you know, going forward, what what are you hoping kind of like what's what's next for you? Where are you hoping to take your your research going forward in the future? Well, um, I am retired and no longer have graduate students. So doing research uh, is difficult without uh, a place to do it. But what I what I have been doing uh, during my retirement years is keeping uh, my best to keep up with the research on self-efficacy, which gets broader and broader. And I've done a lot of, until the pandemic hit, I was doing a lot of international traveling, uh, giving lectures, teaching at universities uh, in Europe and South America, uh, very often uh, uh, talks on self-efficacy, but other topics too. Um, so I'm hoping, what I, what I see looking forward is when I can hop on an airplane and not wear a mask, is I will start traveling again. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jim, it was a real pleasure having you on the show today. Really enjoyed this conversation. If uh, people want to find out more about your research or connect with you, what sort of resources, where would you direct them to? Well, um, I have a personal website at George Mason University, uh, which has a list of publications. It also has access to my, uh, my CV, my resume, which has a list of my publications. And they're also welcome to email me. Awesome. Awesome. And I, and I can give you my email address. Okay. We will right now. Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> J-M-A-D-D-U-X at G-M-U dot E-D-U. Perfect. I'll, Perfect. I'll say it one more time. J-M-A-D-D-U-X at G-M-U dot E-D-U. Awesome. I'd be happy to hear from anyone in the audience about anything. Okay, we will certainly include that in the in the show notes as well. Jim, last question I want to ask you, just in terms of if if someone came to you on the street and said, you know, what's what's the most important sort of piece of psychology, or what what do I need to know um, to enhance my life? Like, how would you distill kind of some of the stuff that we've talked about into you know kind of a, a piece of advice for someone? Um be more courageous, take awesome. more risks, get yourself out there, try something new, um, think of what you were afraid of doing and take a stab at doing a little bit of it and seeing how it works out. Great. Yeah, so go so courage. Awesome. Awesome. Well, if you guys enjoyed the show today, I would really appreciate it if you could give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Also, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel for Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. And you can uh, listen to the podcast on any of the major audio platforms, whether that be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any of the others. We are on them all. Jim, I wanted to really thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing all of your, your knowledge and expertise expertise with the with the audience. It was my pleasure. It was fun. <laughs>